Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Anthony. Uh, I work for Corelight, and the title of this talk is A Structural Approach to Modeling Encrypted Connections. Uh, before I start, I just want to remind everyone that uh, there are feedback surveys in all of the Slack channels for the talks. So if you could please fill those out, that'd be great. This is both the introduction and conclusion slide for this talk. It's the main takeaway that I want everyone to have um, uh, at the end of this 20-minute uh, session. And that's uh, by understanding the rules of a protocol or the semantic um, the way that messages interact uh, in a protocol, you can actually make inferences on connections of that protocol, even if the connection is wrapped within a, uh, a encrypted channel, such as TLS. <clears throat> so my talk is divided into about three sections. Uh, the first section, I will talk about how you can conceptualize connections as sequences, uh, as well as uh, state machines and how those two can interact. I'll then go on to provide a really simple toy example of how those connections can be thought of. Uh, and then I'll go into specific use cases involving both the SSH and RDP protocols. Uh, so TCP uh, has a three-way handshake that consists of a SYN, a SYN ACK, and an ACK. And um, to represent a TCP connection as a sequence, um, you can think of these three events uh, as being required uh, for TCP to function. So uh, if these happen out of order or if these things don't happen at all, uh, TCP doesn't operate properly. And any protocol can sort of be thought of in this way where you have a, a sequence of things that happen, uh, eventually you know, the connection is used and then potentially another sequence of things that happens to tear down the connection. <clears throat> this is a uh, state machine diagram or a flow chart of the TCP state machine that I stole from Wikipedia. Uh, and what I want um, to impress upon people here is that, you know, this sequence of events, uh, the TCP handshake, actually translates into uh, a state machine. So upon sending a send packet, the client will enter uh, the gray box on the right. Uh, after the handshake, both sides of the connection will enter this established green box in the center. The connection will be used. And then upon exchanging FIN or reset messages, uh, the connection moves into the orange box at the bottom, which is closed. Um, I need to talk a, a bit about some background uh, for this presentation. Uh, and the first piece of information is that uh, much of this work was inspired by this SPLT feature from a paper titled Deciphering Malware's Use of TLS Without Decryption. It's a really great paper. There's actually an implementation of the system uh, described in the paper called JOY. Uh, and SPLT stands for Sequence of Packet Lengths and Times. Uh, I, I mentioned this paper because after reading it, uh, the authors uh, noted something like a 30% gain in uh, true positives in their classifier based on this feature. And I saw that and thought, wow, that's a really great feature, 30% gain. How else can this be used? <clears throat> uh, this work generalizes across protocols, including encrypted ones, because it takes in the, four the four following uh, pieces of information into consideration. And that's the lengths of messages exchanged in a connection, uh, the order that those messages are exchanged, the direction that those uh, messages were sent from or to, so who was the originator and who was the responder of the connection, as well as the inner arrival times of the messages sent during a connection. Uh, and I wanna point out that this isn't just some magic secret core light sauce. Uh, there's actually a package, an open source package that uh, implements some of these things called SPL SPT. It took second place in the most recent Zeek package contest, and it will log uh, those four pieces of information that I just mentioned to files for you, for you to go analyze. So you can play with this at home. Okay, so a little bit about Zeek. Uh, there's a specific type uh, within Zeek called a vector. And as connections can be thought of as sequences, sequences can be represented in Zeek script land as vectors. And a vector is essentially an array that starts uh, being indexed by zero and can be dynamically grown. Uh, in the following example, uh, originator messages or messages sent from the, the client of the connection will be positively signed. Uh, 
uh, responder messages will be negatively signed and order of the messages exchanged will be preserved based on the index of the vector. So this is a very simple vector uh, in Zeek script land, the vector of integers. Oops. And here in the red box, I've circled or I've squared the first message. It was sent by the originator and it was of length 24. Here I've highlighted the second message of the connection, the first message sent by the responder, and it's also of size 24, but it's negative because it's from the responder. <clears throat> and just to visualize this vector, you can think of it as uh, a bar graph where each vertical uh, dotted line is an index of the vector. And so, okay, red is positive, blue is negative. You kind of uh, can visually see what I'm talking about here. But this is still pretty abstract um, and I'll get into more concrete uses in a, a couple slides. <clears throat> so once you have these vectors in script land that represent sequences, that represent connections, uh, you can do interesting things on them, interesting operations on these vectors. You can do uh, things like taking the head or the tail of a vector. So let's say the vector is 10 messages long and you're only interested in the last eight, well, you can chop off the first two. Or perhaps you're interested in finding the maximum size packet sent by the uh, originator of the connection and there you would just find the maximum size packet of the vector. Uh, you can also do things like runs where perhaps you're interested in a uh, consecutive uh, uh, subsequence of increasing message sizes. Uh, you can also do things like selectively take the producer consumer ratio or the PCR of uh, subset, sub sequences within your vector. So let's say your connection is 100 messages long and you're only interested in the producer consumer ratio for uh, message uh, two through four. Well, you can select those uh, offsets and calculate the PCR for that. And uh, you can also do things like find the first occurrence of some pattern, the second occurrence of some pattern, uh, et cetera. Oops. Um, okay, so this is the point in the talk where I sort of uh, go into specific use cases. Um, so far, we've kind of been thinking about things in abstract terms, and this is where we get a little more concrete. Um, so before I talk about how this can be applied to SSH, there's a few bits of information you need to be aware of surrounding the SSH protocol. First. The SSH protocol is actually three sub-protocols. Uh, the transport protocol, which facilitates encryption, the authentication protocol, which authenticates the client to the server, and then the connection sub-protocol where the connection is actually used. So <clears throat> if you think about the different ways that SSH can be used, the connection sub-protocol can be used to emulate an interactive terminal or transfer a file or forward X11 messages. Uh, and these protocols happen uh, in this order, transport, authentication, and connection. And they're essentially uh, three states of the SSH state machine. Uh, the next bit of information that we need to know is that there's a clear text handshake uh, that happens in SSH before encryption begins. And this does things like uh, facilitate the negotiation of the SSH protocol version, so version one or version two, uh, and it also helps um, exchange uh, cipher information for establishing encryption. I also wanna point out that SSH PDUs uh, according to the RFCs, uh, use the term packets to describe SSH packets. So an SSH packet structure uh, is different than an IP packet structure. And so moving on, moving forward from here, if I use the term packet, uh, I'm referring to an SSH packet and not an IP packet. <coughs> Excuse me. So we have a similar uh, slide here um, from the few slides back. Uh, but this will be specifically on SSH. So at the beginning of SSH in this uh, white uh, square oblong shape, um, we represent the clear text negotiation that, negotiation that happens before encryption. And we're not really concerned with that. We don't include that in our vector. Uh, after encryption begins, the transport uh, sub protocol uh, takes place. Let me see that here. Uh, and then the authentication sub protocol takes place represented by yellow. And then the connection subprotocol takes place represented by purple. Uh, 
so you can kind of see how uh, these three different states, I guess four states, but we really are only concerned with the last three, are um, representative of a SSH connection or of any SSH connection. This is sort of an abstraction here. So what can we do with these vectors once we uh, have connections represented in script land? Well, um, something that's actually in Zeek right now, you can go read this in the SSH analyzer, is identifying uh, or inferring how many uh, uh, authentication attempts were made in a connection. So if you can infer when the transport protocol transitions to the authentication protocol and when the authentication protocol transitions to the connection protocol, and you can count the number of messages that happened within the authentication sub protocol, you can infer how many authentication attempts there were, which is pretty cool. Um, something else that you can infer uh, based on the connection sub protocol is what the connection was used for. So was the connection transferring keystrokes for an interactive shell? Was the connection transferring files, as I said before? If the connection was transferring keystrokes and you can identify where those keystrokes are in a vector, you may be able to count those keystrokes. And if you can count those keystrokes, you may be able to infer how long a command uh, is that was typed at the shell, which is pretty interesting. Um, you can also do things like identify if certain states or sub-protocols were skipped. Uh, and I'll get to this a little bit later in, in a, a graph. Um, but if the uh, transport sub-protocol transitioned to the connection sub-protocol without going through the authentication sub-protocol, well, there was an authentication bypass in the connection. This is a graph of approximately, I think, two or 300 SSH connections. Uh, represented as sequences. Uh, again, we have positive values are uh, sent from the originator of the connection, negative values being sent from the responder of the connection. Each line represents a single connection. Uh, each vertical line, again, represents an, an index in the vector. Uh, and lines are made slightly transparent so that we can see where they overlap. And I think this is really cool. You can actually see some visual patterns here, some, some things uh, kind of stand out. And one I think that stands out, I've circled here in the red box, uh, this horizontal line. You see them on both the positive and negative sides of the x-axis. These actually indicate file transfers. So if you think about how a file transfer works, a client writing a file to the server is going to try and do it as efficiently as possible, which means it's going to try and stuff as many bytes as it can into each message before it sends it to the server. So we see these uh, sort of maximum size packets being sent repeatedly, and that's indicative of the file transfer. <clears throat> Here we see a pattern that I've called uh, a ping pong, which is uh, essentially a client sending a packet to the server and the server sending a packet back to the client. And this is how keystrokes manifest within the SSH protocol. So uh, when you type a key at your keyboard, that key is sent in a packet to the SSH server. The SSH server process it, processes that keystroke and sends it back to the client so that the client can display it uh, in a terminal. And that sort of back and forth uh, pattern manifests here as a ping pong. Uh, the last pattern that I'll highlight here uh, is this file transfer um, that occurs around index or offset one or two of a, a connection. And this is very odd. It's a little difficult to see here, but this is strange um, because if you think about the three sub protocols of SSH, the transport sub protocol requires a minimum of two packets to transition to the authentication sub protocol. The authentication sub protocol requires a minimum of two packets to authenticate a client. And then the connection sub protocol requires a minimum of two packets to facilitate a file transfer, which means file transfers cannot legally happen in the SSH protocol until at least offset six in a vector. Uh, so this connection that I've highlighted here is uh, an SSH connection that did not transition through the authentication sub protocol correctly. Here I slightly overlay, or I, I overlay the sub protocols uh, in a way that slightly makes sense. These are, these are sort of, um, flexible, they're not necessarily <clears throat> static, but uh, you kind of, you get the point. Okay, 
So I've got four minutes left and I'm gonna go really quickly. There's two bits of information that we need to know about RDP before we can look at some RDP graphs. The first is around encryption. RDP has two forms of encryption. The first is native encryption, which is RC4 baked into the RDP protocol. It's total garbage, don't use it. The other is TLS, uh, where RDP actually wraps itself in a TLS connection. It's less garbage than native, but it's still not great. Um, the other bit of information that you need to know is about the RDP handshake. So <laughs> the TCP handshake is a three-way handshake. The RDP handshake, oh boy, it's anywhere from 30 to 50 messages. It's got 12 substages. It is complex. Uh, <laughs> I hope everyone has this memorized because I'm going to the next slide. This is the RDP handshake turned on its side. This is the RDP handshake turned on its side and made slightly transparent. This is the graph that was underneath that slightly transparent handshake and it doesn't line up exactly, uh, but I think it illustrates the point. So this is approximately 10 RDP connections wrapped in TLS. Uh, what's interesting here is that similar to the SSH protocol where it had the ping pong pattern, we see another ping pong pattern here uh, these patterns repeat across protocols, but they have completely different meanings. In SSH, they indicate keystrokes. In RDP, they actually indicate channel joins. Uh, I'm not going to dive into what channel joins are used for, but it's just it's interesting to note that these patterns sort of reappear. <clears throat> this is about 2,300 RDP connections wrapped in TLS. And again, I've boxed out some interesting patterns that I think visually emerge. Uh, there's a clear client ceiling at some point in the connection, uh, you know, uh, client packet uh, around index three, two or three um, varies quite a bit. Uh, we see some server ceilings. Uh, the point here is that if I can visually spot these patterns, I can probably write a little script function to identify these patterns. <clears throat> this is approximately 70 RDP connections over native encryption. And why I included this, uh, well, RDP is the same protocol regardless of how it's encrypted. But if you look at these two graphs, these protocols look very different. Uh, they have different patterns in their uh, connection sequences. <laughs> okay, so with a minute left, whew, here is my concluding slide. It's the same as my first slide and it's the one piece of information I hope everyone takes away from this presentation, and that is by understanding a protocol and all of the semantic rules involved in that protocol, it's possible to make inferences on instances of that protocol, even if those instances are transmitted within a secure channel, for example, TLS. Here are some references. Uh, additionally, I have some blogs on the Corelight website that you can go read. Thanks for listening.